Do you want me to hello everybody? <laughs> hey Hugh. Hey, it's Hi. been a great Hi. day of learning. Uh, been yeah, really cool. Yeah, I've been listening right next to JJ, and also uh, we caught a bit of Jim's uh, lecture earlier as well. Mm -hmm. We know Jim too well to sit there and listen to his lectures over and over again. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I'll just get the uh, the screen up anyway. So okay. Check that works. How's that looking? Yeah, so could you tell us a little bit about yourself, Hugh, and how you got into all of this? Uh, megalithomania? Yeah, so you should be able to see the uh, the big screen here. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, yeah, I can give you a little bit of an introduction. Well, I could just start because I, 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 I kind of introduced myself as we go through anyway. Um, so, are we good to go? We're good to go. This is Hugh okay, Newman, well, everybody. Hi. <laughs> I'll, uh, okay, well, I'll just introduce myself as we go through, so that's fine. Um, yeah, well, thanks again, Robert, for bringing us in on this wonderful online conference. Obviously, it's a real pity we couldn't be there physically. We'd literally be on a plane now um, if it was all happening. But we're all November next year anyway. So this is the talk I'm going to share with you today. This is kind of megalithomania is kind of my company that I've run since 2006. But it kind of sums up where a lot of us are at. We're like, we have a mania for megaliths and ancient sites. Um, I'm going to focus on serpents or serpent symbolism you know, the way it's marked in the landscape, how this connects with earth energies and the enchantment of the landscape. Um, so these are some of the things we're gonna go through. Uh, I'll just introduce myself in one moment, but this first I wanted to show you, because we're gonna look at a few very ancient sites that have evidence of this kind of serpent motif. And there's very high significance in this, because this goes way back to the time of the Watchers and the Anunnaki, um, written about in the very earliest texts. And how this sort of spread through the world through different cultures and how it may or i believe it definitely is connected with earth energies and how to harness them for various uh, consciousness and fertility purposes so there's some of the books i've been i've written or been involved in writing jim i co-authored this giants of record with him a, a few years ago it's on the tv show search for the lost giants with him as well ancient aliens a whole bunch of those i've been on and a few other, you know, book on earth grids and stone circles. Most recently, Megalith Studies in Stone came out last year or so. And this is the new one that's coming out later this year that me and Jim are working on, uh, which we're going to touch on parts here because there's a lot to do with geomancy and uh, how the ancient giants worked with the landscape. It's actually them who actually kind of manifested all this. And so, you know, I've been running uh, a conference called Megalithomania since 2006. We run tours now. This is some of the tours we're hopefully doing um, over the next year or two, but some of these may or may not happen. Oh, we were sort of playing it by ear, but that's one of the things me and JJ and Jim are very involved with. We love getting out and about, showing people around. We spend, if we, when we can, we spend as much time as possible traveling around, uh, even, you know, my, I've got this thing back garden pretty much Stonehenge so this is where we go for walks nowadays um, and that that is again that image there pretty much sums up what it's all about to me this high level of celebration and sort of mania you get with these sites here's Stonehenge in the snow uh, which is opposite to what it's like right now but with with Stonehenge for instance let's start there um, we have this tradition of giants ex building Stonehenge and existing in this area right near where I live. Um, and this is the earliest depiction that's ever known of Stonehenge. And this goes back to the 13th or 14th century. And it was in a, a, a French version of the history of the Kings of Britain. And it clearly shows a giant lifting one of the lintels into place with Merlin and King Ambrosius next to him. And so the earliest name of Stonehenge, for instance, was called the Giant's Dance or the Giant's uh, kind of celebration or something like this. But the thing with Stonehenge is really, it really marks and it is a symbol of what this talk and what a lot of the researchers at this Earth Origins conference are really all about. And these, you know, this can be summed up here partly by what Alexander Tom, who's a professor of Oxford University, I'll read this out to you. Only in the period when megalithic man was setting out the sophisticated stone rings has a sufficiently high standard of mathematical knowledge 
and skill ever been reached before the 15th century AD. Even today, there are few archaeologists capable of appreciating the underlying geometry. But it's not just the geometry we're dealing with here. We're dealing with the, the hidden metrology, the number systems. We're dealing with um, aspects of earth energies and geomancy. <clears throat> and also the whole idea of geodesy, which is the placement of sites in relation to one another across the landscape. And the interesting thing about Stonehenge, which a lot of people don't realize, that these three blobs of paint, which were in the car park until recently, which would have marked three massive post holes like these, these pine posts, like totem poles, were actually placed in the landscape 10,000 years ago or thereabouts, which is 5,000 years before Stonehenge was built. So someone was marking the geodetic position of Stonehenge. I think I know who that was, which we'll get into a little bit later. And this connects with a very strange story um, to do with the Watchers and the Anunnaki. And this is all in the ancient texts. Now they marked this spot because of, partly because it was, it's a very powerful part of the landscape energetically. You get a lot of earth energies and strange light phenomena happening there. But it's also the latitude is very important for the study of the moon and the sun. At this exact latitude, you have this wonderful configuration. You can see this blue rectangle. This is called the lunation rectangle, or if you divide it in half, it's called the lunation triangle. And this is the 512-13 Pythagorean system, 2,000, 3,000 years before Pythagoras was even born. Um, and it clearly has this beautiful symmetry where it marks the different moon rises, moon sets, and other such things. So this, along with the design of the whole system of this whole Stonehenge landscape. They were creating this harmony. They were creating this kind of geomantic kind of energy, not just in one side, but across the whole country. And this blue rectangle, if you divide it in half, it becomes what's called the lunation triangle. And if you expand that across the landscape, 2,500 times in size, it marks the position of where the blue stones of Stonehenge came from and Lundy Island which is on the exact same latitude as is Glastonbury. And all these sites, which is something we're writing about in our new book, um, mark famous giant discoveries that have been found for going from eight foot to 14 and a half feet tall skeletons, as though they were marking these spots with these giant ancient rulers, skeletons over and over again. So that's something we're gonna, I'm not gonna get in too much into the giants in this lecture, but it's something me and Jim have just been relentlessly writing this book about for the last couple of years. We're actually on the final chapter right now. Um, but we can you know, have a few questions about that. This is actually the blue stones themselves. This is the spotted blue dolerite, very magnetic, very highly charged, very highly crystalline stone, which was deliberately bought from Wales. Here is another uh, quarry up in the Preseli Mountains. This is this is a type of stone called blue rhyolite, slightly different, but you find this at specific ancient sites around the world. And it's not only the Lunation Triangle, we have the 512-13, the red one there. We actually have other ones in the landscape, like this great 345 Pythagorean Triangle, linking up other major stone circle sites. So again, we get into this in our book. Um, I just wanted to mention that here because all these sites are extremely important uh, when it comes to geomancy, but also creating this enchantment through the landscape, which we're going to get into what that really means over the next hour or so. Even, even the line you see here that goes from the Bluestone site to Stonehenge, actually extends all the way around the world. It hits Delphi, Giza, Mecca, Serpent Mound in Ohio, and Caramore Complex in Ireland. And so it's a great earth circle. It perfectly divides the earth in two. So they were measuring, they were measuring, they were geomancing the whole world in prehistory. And Stonehenge is a key aspect of this, which is often overlooked. A lot of people don't realize the importance of Stonehenge when you come to the, the invisible aspects of it. And you can see that in more detail. And this is the work of Robin Heath. So if you can get any books by Robin Heath, especially The Measure of Albion that he co-wrote with John Michelle, which I think is called The Lost Science of Measuring the Earth in America, published by our good friend David Hatcher Childress in America. Um, and yeah, again, this image here is the one I mentioned earlier, which dates back to uh, the 13th or 12th century. 
One of the stories with Stonehenge, which is quite interesting, and it links again with, I believe, geomancy and geodesy linking these sites around the world, is that the tr tradition is that giants bought stones from Africa, constructed Stonehenge originally island, and then eventually, a few thousand years later, Merlin transported the stones over using magical means or something called engines or gears, using some kind of magical power. And this area of Africa they were said to have came from, Trilithons, like Stonehenge, have now actually been found there. So these are in Libya. This is near uh, Tripoli. You see the one here as well. So you can see these are almost identical to what we find at Stonehenge. These legends suddenly start to make sense. This is actually in Tunisia, um, just on the, near the border with Libya. And the masonry style is very similar. We have mortise and tenon joints. We also have uh, classic stone circles in Libya as well and also in Morocco, such as Masura, which is the, probably about the fifth largest stone circle in the world. Avebury is number one, obviously. And it has the same kind of system of measurements, geometry, and geodesy within the different aspects of the site, and astronomy as well. So this is Avebury. There's me waving like an idiot, uh, but with zooming out with uh, and it just gives you a sense of scale of the largest stone circle in the world, much bigger. It's so much bigger than Stonehenge. In fact, uh, Avebury is, you could fit about 50 Stonehenges in, I would imagine. Uh, the two stone circles that are found, smaller ones within Avebury, are larger than Stonehenge. So this, this is the real megalithic site on the planet. If you look to the right there, you can see Silbury Hill in the background as well. Um, and that's the largest man-made mound in Europe. So this is just something I do, do with my drone uh, quite a lot nowadays. There's not much else to do, is there, obviously, all in lockdown and everything. So, uh, and yeah, so this just gives you, you know, an inkling of Avebury. It, John Aubrey wrote in the 17th century, it does as much exceed in greatness the so renowned Stonehenge as a key cathedral doeth a parish church is so much larger and this this may be what it would have looked like with silbury hill there as well and the devil's den dolmen which is nearby of course you know just to bring more magic to the landscape we have all these remarkable crop circles that appear everywhere which is something that's fascinated me and actually it's what got me into this in the first place i was kind of you know into ufos and crop circles in my teens um, you know, kind of obsessed by that kind of thing. That drew me into the magical world of these megaliths. But Avebury is really special. I mean, not only is it the largest, most magnificent stone circle in the world, it connects with, with other sites around the world. Um, and, you know, for instance, its position on the planet, not many people know this. If you, if you, do, if you want to find the latitude of Stonehenge, which is 51 degrees, such as, you know, all these numbers going after it, what you actually, um, find is is that if you divide 360 over seven what comes out of your calculator is the exact latitude of stonehenge so from the equator we go around the world you know over part uh, over through avebury through the north pole continue around from the equator to where avebury sits latitudinally that is one seventh of the circumference of the planet as though they were deliberately marking this um and so that alone can create this kind of harmonic global kind of system which you know which is something i get into which is the whole earth grids theory um and uh hang on a sec, where is it? let me just get my notes up here details yeah here we go so 360 over 7 equals 51.428571 dot 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 and so on and so on and so you do that in a calculator and that's the exact latitude where everybody sits so how could they possibly do that how could they possibly work out that i mean even um you know even luxor in egypt so so if you then divide uh, from the equator to the north pole you know that quadrant if you divide that into seven uh two sevenths up is luxor four sevenths up is avebury so again, we're finding it's got this seven encoded within it. Uh, and, and this goes on and on and on when you start looking at this. And this isn't just for surveying the planet. This is creating this harmonic system, like energetically around the planet. That's more detail. This is a reconstruction by Nicholas Mann, who's done some excellent books. Each of those stone circles in the center, the small ones, are larger than Stonehenge, a lot larger. 
and it has these great avenues going off in the distance as well which you can see in this image here from uh, uh, which is um, William Stukeley did this in the uh, 17th century and it stretches over about two miles and it's got Silbury Hill in the in the middle there and there's a lot of earth energy here which we're going to get into in a while but I wanted to look at the symbol here because some of the stones weigh up to 50 tons there's probably 400 maybe 500 stones that came from a few miles away the great circle itself there's thought to be 99 or 100 stones um, and you can see the symbol here it looks like a kind of serpent but well, this is actually an ancient symbol of two serpents kind of eating the egg in the center this is a very ancient symbol that probably originated at Avebury itself or even a little bit earlier but it was built it was developed here and it became this kind of worldwide thing so we have to question where does this strange serpent symbolism come from um, I believe the first real evidence we see it in abundance is at a site called Gebekli Tepe in southeast Turkey. Now, this is an absolutely mind-blowing place. I've been here maybe five times. Uh, first time we went there, we took we actually took Graham Hancock there. We ran a tour out there, myself and Andrew Collins. You can see it there before they put the roof on it. Um, so yeah, and it's got multiple stone circles within the structure maybe 40 in some estimates they're they've all been completely buried they're kind of mostly oval shape like with a three four kind of strange oval geometry which is actually a harmonic of the human voice and they're 23 foot some of the pillars they're carved out of beautiful high quality limestone that's just from the area there's a quarry right nearby we've actually been there uh, and it got deliberately it got used for a couple of thousand years and it got deliberately repaired and then reburied so no one like a time capsule the thing is the problem with this is is that it goes back to at least 11,600 years at least and probably 12,000 or more in some estimates so this is five or six thousand years older than Stonehenge but when they were closing the Beckley Tepe down they actually that was the time when the post holes at Stonehenge were going in and so now there's even new DNA research connecting this part of the world with Wiltshire of all places. Here's some of the alignments worked out by um, uh, Andrew Collins, uh, linking it with Cygnus. I'm not going to go into this in detail, but it just shows you the symbols carved on these stones, a stunning 3D relief carvings, marking all many different symbols. We even have the bag symbols at the top, which Jim was uh, talking about earlier, I believe, and JJ possibly. Other people suggest it can be serious and so on and so forth but this is where it is in the landscape there's a bunch of other sites there as well and this really is the garden of eden this is the original garden of eden where the symbol of the serpent and probably the technologies the agricultural revolution everything came out we even have this uh, head on the left here which is from a site called navali churi and this is fascinating because this is like a vedic symbol from india carved on this nine or so thousand year old head so what is that all about you know what does this really mean um you know why was it happening here we have other animals in perfect 3d relief carved out of these pillars no one in the world was supposed to be doing this back then but what we do find there quite a lot we have these other kind of weird totem poles possibly like the ones that were at stonehenge we have these strange kind of hoops but then we have these serpents. You see that serpent on the top there and the cut marks and these critters that are about to be eaten by the serpent by the looks of it. And then we have other very strange symbols of almost alien looking heads. This is the quarry where we found, we actually found a 12 foot pillar no one had reported before when I was there with Andrew in 2014. And we even discovered this in a, the museum. It seems, seems to show a depiction of you know, like an artistic depiction carved on a very small piece of bone, like three inches long, of the, the T-shaped pillars there. We also have the same shape we find at Amarumuru, carved in the rock at um, this site in Peru, which is, which is called the doorway of the serpent in some traditions. We find these T-pillars also in Menorca, but much later date going into the Bronze Age. But the thing I want to get to here is the fact there's this is some of the earliest depictions of very, very ancient serpents in the world. You can see these here. Also here, carved on all these different stones. 
and then there's multiple i'm just showing you a few here there's multiple 3d relief surfaces, often going upwards or downwards and the middle one here is gebekli tepe the one on the left is gigantia and gozo next to malta one on the right is saqqara in Egypt. So we have the same symbol of all these different ancient cultures. We really have to question where this came from. Well, this symbol here is the symbol of Inki. He was one of the founders of the Anunnaki in the Garden of Eden, or Kamasa, whatever you want to call it. They're also called the Anunnaki, they're called the Anunnaki. The later groups became known as the Watchers, uh, the Grigori, and then the Nephilim, and so forth. But this was his symbol from day one. He was, the, he was one of the founding gods of the Garden of Eden who came down from Mount Hermon and actually created this civilization probably around the time of Gobekli Tepe, in my opinion. And for some reason, the serpent was connected not only with wisdom, but also with healing. And, and now, as it was then, medicine as well. That was one of the aspects that was found there. But, and it seems that from this area, this knowledge spread around the world quite quite intensely in fact up until you know relatively recent times we have the plume serpent symbolism as well we find that in south america for instance we have viracocha tiwanaku and so forth uh, the island of the sun but even on lake titicaca itself we have this temple dedicated to viracocha the plume serpent that arose out of the waters of lake titicaca we find serpents carved all over Cusco and other sites all over Peru. We even have a snake temple called Santiago de Oje, and this is around the edge of Lake Titicaca. We have a great serpent, there's me and JJ there a couple of years ago. And that's actually a cobra. And this is more serpents, it's a place called Silistani, these beautiful uh, Chilpa round towers. Also at Catimbo, we find many of these here, for instance. And you can just see the puffy polygonal work here, which is another fascination of mine. Um, yeah, more serpents carved here. But the thing about these sites around Lake Titicaca, they, look at these here, and like, just for a second, just dwell on these for a moment. I mean, you look at the symbol on the bottom left there, for instance, it's like a 3D relief carving. And then you have these flatter relief carvings. And these are almost identical to what we find in Gobekli Tepe. The top two are Gobekli Tepe, the bottom two, are Silistani and Kutimbo, and they're very close to each other around the edge of Lake Titicaca. Is that a coincidence? I don't know. I mean, I wrote an article about this about what, four years ago. It's on the Graham Hancock website. You can check it out if you like, go into detail about the possible connections here. And the fact that the dating doesn't make sense uh, of the sites in Peru, and they should, they're most certainly much older. We have a site here called Bukhara. Again, this is actually before Tiwanaku, apparently. Again, we have the plume serpent symbolism around the edge of Lake Titicaca, the northern edge of the lake. We have the same symbolism in North America, like the serpent mound, and not many people realize that it actually has plumes. It's actually a plumed serpent. You can see the little uh, bits around the neck there, they're actually wings. So this is a winged plumed serpent, much like we find in South America. In North America, we find it also. And this is very strongly connected with earth energies, again. And at the center of the egg, which is holding in its mouth, much like we find Avebury, um, we, there was once a great standing stone, which is pictured here, which has fallen down the bluff, that serpent now. Not many people even know this exists. It's not advertised. You have to meet up with Ross Hamilton or Jeffrey Wilson, and they'll show you around. Giants were found at Serpent Mound, just to throw a giant in there, so the postcard, um, like over seven foot giant. But there were multiple Serpent Mounds, uh, Illinois, Arkansas, Ontario, Canada, and so forth, all over North America. In fact, Jeffrey Wilson, this is from Warren County, Ohio, suggests there are in fact over 60 Serpent Mounds in North America, 60. Only one of them is known about, but there's 60 of them. And many of these were plumed serpents complicated coiled serpents. We even have one in Scotland as well, a Loch Nell, which has now been mostly destroyed, uh, a serpent next to a lake. And this plume serpent symbolism, symbolism sorry, is found in Colombia with Bochica. He's much like Viracocha, he's much like Quetzalcoatl. He bore the arts of civilization, often depicted as arriving on rafts of serpents or boats with serpents on them with uh, often with robes that had like serpentine skin on them. 
and he was said to have founded a site called um, I've completely forgotten the name of this uh, a site in southern uh, Colombia where we have serpent symbolism here but in Mexico we find Quetzalcoatl which you know which uh, is, is the most strong serpent plume serpent symbolism uh, which really began in the time of the Olmecs, although it could be much, much older. It could go back to the time of the gods and the giants, which is a whole other epochs before this happened. And again, we find these Olmecs, which absolutely fascinating. I've been visiting Olmec land since 2003. Uh, I absolutely adore the Olmecs. I, I think I am Olmec, in fact, um, uh, some people say. But, you know, we have the first pyramids. We have the first megalithic construction in Mexico. We have the man bags, uh, which is what you know Jim um, talks about a bit too much in my opinion. And we also have great serpents um, encoded within the landscape itself. This is actually the river, Coastal Cocos River, where the Olmecs, oh sorry, Quetzalcoatl on his raft of serpents was said to have arrived. He came in at the mouth of the serpent and traveled down this river, founding the first civilizations of North America, uh, Central America. If we look at these little islands uh, within the river, these are where the Olmec sites are on the body of the serpents. And where he, he, he'd done his thing, he was teaching the arts of civilization for 20 years. Then he disappeared, claiming he would come back. He left at a place near the head of the serpent, cultural cocos. This means serpent sanctuary. And so we have all this symbolism here, which is quite stunning. We have the classic, this is possibly the first depiction of the plumed serpent with a guy holding his, his man bag. Um, and we find this obviously all over the world. I think JJ and uh, uh, Jim talked about this and this is a symbol uh, a graphic put together by JJ which shows you that it's found in different places on the left there we have Hapi who's the one of the gods of ancient Egypt we have it in um, Greece and Sumeria and other such places almost directly the same symbol and I've always questioned what this really means and I think it comes back to the whole story of utilizing and working with partly anyway to do with earth energies and also the symbol of wisdom we have plumed serpents in egypt as well uh, i'm not going to get into that right now but we find it everywhere and i think there's a reason for this because the way serpents move through the land um they kind of go like this they move in exactly the same way as natural earth energies do and it's almost identical and there's an elemental force with these earth energies people don't really understand and, and, and only, only in modern times we're starting to understand the real nature of the magnetic field of the planet which is what we are affected by every day you know that a lot of people don't don't realize this but we are affected by this almost every day um we have fault lines uh, earthquake epicenters we have natural telluric electric currents moving through the earth these kind of expand at dawn and shrink at dusk and when they expand often when you wake up in the morning even if it's cloudy and foggy or whatever dark you get woken up by something and it's these charging through the landscape where the solar energy is hitting the planet uh, affecting the magnetic field and sending these signals through the landscape which affects our magnetic kind of connectors in the brain and in the, in the different glands in the brain um, and, uh, and it's a big mystery about this magnetic field but when it kind of comes down to the earth and softens during the day it divides up into these telluric electric currents going through the land which switch like a motor really like an old motor between magnetic and electric and this affects us but the ancients understood that you could harness this for various reasons um, you know and you can actually manipulate this and many of these ancient sites were built for this purpose they were actually built to uh, almost like acupuncture points like needles like megaliths hitting the ground uh, and controlling and manipulating and working with this type of energy and different types of geology um, you know, ch chalk, for instance, which are kind of water rich, allow the electric charge to move through quickly. Other types of geology, much harder, less crystalline rock, for instance, stops it moving so easily and so forth. And so you get this 
what's called where these two where different geology meets different types you get something called a conductivity discontinuity and this is where you often get balls of light which are often photographed at many of these sites there was some research done at this site uh, these sites in new england for instance where they found that their natural magnetic anomalies because of the differences in geology and light phenomena and magnetic fluctuations were recorded but specifically right at where the chamber was like it was built on top so they could actually harness this energy for some purpose and it now appears and this is the brilliant work of john burke and Kaj halberg uh, in their book seed of knowledge stone of plenty who is one of the most important books written on any you know any ancient mystery subject that they were harnessing this energy and they, they understood it they had a scientific understanding of this which is probably based on intuitive understanding originally and this is the true nature of geomancy or divination of the earth where you're divining with the self to actually kind of get an understanding of what's going on rather than using scientific tools which obviously the ancients probably didn't have uh, this just shows you one of these chambers. I actually photographed a ball of light there, you know, when at dusk, when the energy was fluctuating. And this just shows you the way that the natural um, earth energies move around, around these ancient sites. So we have this. This is uh, going back to, you know, Tiwanaku, uh, Bolivia. This is the, you know, the realm of Viracocha. Um, this is an old photo of the Kalasasaya temple, which is again like Avebury has 99 stones around its perimeter. But there's a major magnetic field at Tiwanaku on top of the Akapana pyramid, uh, going deep into the earth. It's flanked by two fault lines and it has remarkable energies here. It's, it, it's very strange. And we, we, I went there with ancient aliens, we filmed an episode there. And we got all these crazy fluctuations on this magnetometer that I had. Uh, put it around here somewhere. It's called a tri-field magnetometer. And we've got, we had other, other equipment with us. And we were picking up all sorts of things. We had exactly the same thing at Balanced Rock in New York. This is a major megalithic site in New York State, North Salem, um, outside a fire station, of all things. And I've been going here for years when I'm in America. Um, they claim it's a glacial erratic that landed conveniently on these different five different quartz blocks, uh, but clearly it isn't. It's actually got carvings on it as well. Uh, it's on, it sits on top of a major negative magnetic anomaly, and uh, it's really quite quite a remarkable sight. And this just shows you, you know, the size of it. It's actually me just walking around it, so you can get a sense of it as part of a video. That I created um, and there's been tests done here we did some tests when we were filming ancient alien we did another we did a show here last April um, and we filmed here it came out it's called the Druid connection or something uh, in America Druids in America or something like this and we picked up stuff with my magnetometer here so we know this is for real uh, we also have this is the original work of John uh, John Burke and Kaj Halberg where they found uh, these were this remarkable negative magnetic anomaly right at this spot and we talked to locals when we were there a few years ago and they claimed that all sorts of strange phenomena happens around this because of the magnetism and this all makes sense to me you know because other sites you know people talk about the strange energies there there's why would they build their site to this inconvenient spot it's all to do with working with the natural energies like an electromagnetic hotspot all different shapes and sizes of megalithic construction can function in different ways and this has been determined by John Burke. Dolmens particularly are interesting because these are found everywhere in the, on the planet. There's mi probably millions of these everywhere, like almost every country you could list has dolmens, including North America, including Colombia, including Japan, Australia even, everywhere. It's almost like there was a simple technology that was passed around the world by these great ancient teachers, um, you know, to share this knowledge. And what happens is, I'll just try and explain this to you. This just shows you some of the results that kind of came from uh, various chambers, dolmens, and pyramids. And when you place your seeds, like the people, there's traditions of these sites, you bring your seeds, you place them inside this chamber um, that some spiritual energy or the ancestors would 
you know, guarantee you a good harvest, but actually what it's doing is you place your seeds in there and at certain times of day or night, it charges it because of the, because it's trapping this natural telluric currents that, that naturally being forced at dawn through this small entrance to this chamber and it's building up, creating all these negative positive ions and all this other different things. And it charges the seeds up at certain times of day and more so at certain times of year, the turnings of the year. So they take the seeds away, go and plant them and realize they were getting three times as much yield, better quality crops and so on and so forth. But what they also found was it was the exact same energy that was, um, giving them massive shifts in consciousness, like awakenings, like almost like out of body altered states, this kind of thing was going on at these sites. And many of the sites that Burke and others looked at um, found that they were often, they, in North America for instance, they were often vision quest sites, or there'd be like carvings on walls in places like Arizona and so forth. And that was where the energy hotspot was because they were having the visionary experience doing their paintings and carvings and so forth. And the same principle applies all over the planet, even in the Great Pyramid, of course, uh, thanks to the work of Chris Dunn. So the same thing applies here, exactly the same thing, but Chris Dunn took this to another level in, in you know, I'm sure you'll know his work, um, where it's not just to do with, you know, building it just on a good bit of earth energies. It's actually like sometimes they're building really heavy sites like the pyramids on fault zones like in Tiwanaku as well. So what they're doing is they're not only, they're kind of stopping earthquakes by absorbing the uh, fault kind of energy coming through, you know, into the site itself and then harnessing that combined with the earth energies, probably cosmic energy and other such things and creating this system. And so, and they, and it all depends on geometry, it all depends on precise measurement systems, orientation, um, even, you know, mathematical formulas and other such things. And also knowing when the energy is going to increase. And this is when you, you know, you apply, somehow you get things working there's a whole system he put in place here i'm not going to go into this in detail but i think it gives you a sense of what these sites were really doing and we even find that um that you know that the placement of the pyramid itself is actually right in the center of the world's land mass there's more land mass going virtually every direction than there is from any other spot on the planet and i had a very very unusual experience in there myself, uh, which kind of confirmed this for me. This was actually in the subterranean chamber. And weirdly, it was on December the 21st, 2012, uh, the, the end of the Mayan calendar, end of the world, in, in some cases, uh, uh, feels like that again at the moment. Uh, but I went down into the subterranean chamber. I was, uh, the problem is I, I had got the worst food poisoning I ever had in my life. I thought I was going to die. I had it for about five days before we had this private access visit uh, on this tour we were doing with with um, some colleagues, friends of us. I was actually there with Michael Tellinger for this trip, actually, strangely. And uh, we and I was so sick, I wasn't going to go. I just couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat. I was puking all the time. It's the worst sickness I've ever had. I was taking all this medicine. It was doing nothing. So I went down, really struggled to get down into the subterranean chamber. I've never been there. Um, as soon as I got in there, um, I felt completely healed, 100%. All my nausea went, sickness went, my energy levels went up. I actually filmed myself in there, sort of explaining what was going on. I was just like, whoa, this is utterly bizarre. So it's almost like this sickness vibration was completely eradicated whilst inside this subterranean chamber. It could have been the cave effect where you go deep enough into the earth, you kind of have some kind of revelation healing experience but it felt like it was new, being neutralized by the geometry of the pyramid coming um you know completely affecting my whole being energetically physically uh, possibly mentally as well and there and i looked into this and there's quite a lot of research done on pyramids i mean i've read the pyramid power book by max toth back in 80s or 70s i think it came out but there's been some work done on these russian and ukrainian pyramids um but they were applying the same kind of uh golden section phi geometry but in different forms much like we find in the great pyramid 
two uh, fiberglass pyramids in Russia, Ukraine, and they were getting stunning results with their work. And this has been ongoing. It's, it's not been it's not known about really in the Western world so much, but the same things that John Burke had been recording at sites all across the planet, um, they had been finding with their own experiments. Uh, you know, they had uh, increased strength of concrete of all things, you know, so there's this whole geopolymer idea. Um, different seeds, you can see number five here, 20 seed types, you've got 20 to 100% growth increase. Uh, even like disease, you know, salmonella and tumors were reduced. Um, you know, and even the surrounding area, the wheat fields were being charged up, and better crops and so forth extinct flowers return and other such things so this is the same they were finding the same principles here as burke had been finding in all these other sites and it made everyone realize that this is a reality these ancient sites have a deeper purpose and that's often why they were built with in stone so they could not be destroyed by humans by cataclysms by anything because they were meant to last. They were multi-generational systems to maintain this harmony through the landscape and guarantee infertility in the crops. Survival tools, really, survival structures uh, for multiple generations to appreciate. And then you start looking into when cataclysms happen. It's not something I'm gonna get into now, but we know the younger Dryas, uh, I'm sure Freddie's going to talk about this we've talked about it already uh something a lot of people have been talking about there seems to be these civilizing efforts around the planet to you know reset the harmony of the landscape and reset these principles after they were destroyed many thousands of years ago and this is where the idea of the grid comes in the planetary grid i've written a book you can you can get that it's published by wooden books it goes into many different aspects one of the small wooden books the gift books um and yeah, you start looking into this and you realize these, these pyramids, especially the Great Pyramid, most significantly, is really the prime meridian of the planet and everything else is harmonically placed according to that. And this is the work of um, William Becker and Beth Hagens. Um, they, they developed this system along with some Russian scientists in the early 70s. And also Buckminster Fuller, some of his principles um, seem to fit in with this as well. And but there's more to this grid than people realize. It's not. It's, it's not. There's not just one grid. There's not just one system that all the sites perfectly match up. There's a much, much deeper principle behind this, where there's different generations building at sites they didn't know about other sites. So there's there's multiple grids and ideas all around the world. A more like more localized version we have, you know, which you can actually t detect with dowsing and different. Um, you know, magnetometers and so forth. We have the Hartman and Curry grids. Um, that's my buddy, Sean Kerwin. He's a master geomancer. Uh, he, he, he helps people with when sometimes these grid lines actually cause problems. You know, you can actually get a crossing of grid lines mixed with underground water. Uh, and vegetation won't grow properly or um, you can even get cancer if you've got your bed in the wrong place and there's these horrible grid lines with the underground water going in the wrong direction and other such things. It's quite serious. So these geomancers are very important, but no one, not, not enough people take them seriously. So I've been, I've been learning from Sean for years. He's, he's like my, one of my teachers. Um, and, uh, and one of the things as well, which is really interesting to me, is that there's an elemental uh, realm here when it comes to working with these grids with these earth energies and other such things and um and so you know we have this otherworldly effect going on if you like and one of the things that um uh sean does he actually directly communicates with elementals like we call them fairies we call them elves whatever you spriggans whatever you want to call them and actually they they're still there and they're still they're all these traditions of these fairy lines and so forth go way way back so we have these uh yeah these different types of elemental beings that these geomancers actually work with which is bizarre i mean I, my friend patrick McManaway, away he was the previous uh, president of the british society of dowsers he gets hired by major agriculture agricultural companies all around the world big farms you know mega farms and other such things to help them in, you know to help balance the energies and increase the crop yield and other such things and he just gets on with it working with these elemental beings gets them to do all the work 
and gets massive results for these massive companies. And they're like, whoa, you know, how does this work? And so the same principles were at play in ancient times. These builders, these megalith builders, weren't just working with this realm, they were working with the elemental realm. And it's been eradicated through modern, you know, Christianity and so forth, but there's still elements, elements of it in Ireland, uh, the, the mountains of Wales, parts of Scotland, even Brittany still has traditions. East Anglia, where I'm from as well, um, they still hold on to these traditions and have this kind of, you know, connection with them because there's, you know, there's different realms we're not aware of. And this is a very important aspect of maintaining this enchantment you keep the fairies happy everything around you the landscape will be happy you know this is how it works and i'm quite you know i'm quite you know i don't really a lot of this i find it hard to kind of get that into my brain but you don't really it's not your brain that kind of processes this um but you know we have this as well this is the work of david cowan um and he works with geopathic stress as well. So people often, you know, a lot of problems we get physically, mentally and energetically can go down to, can really be part of not understanding what our environment properly, our energetic environment. And this is why, you know, this, even this book we're writing now about the giants of Britain, uh, a lot of it is about geomancy, about you know, looking into the elemental realm because these giants are kind of part of that in some way. Um, there's, there's certainly a communication there we need to be looking at. And we have, you know, the way that this is a, um, this is a friend of ours from France who, who did some uh, dancing with us a few years ago. And often these sites, these Hartman and Curry grids, which often cause problems for us, which are fine normally, but if they're messed with, they can cause problems. And this is the why things like Feng Shui, um, which is basically the eastern form of geomancy, it's the same principles where you're working with these movements and shapes and energies in the landscape. It's all about harmony, all about bringing harmony, balance of yin yang in Feng Shui, for instance. It's the same principles here, but the way we build now with motorways, uh, constructions, office blocks, and so forth, we lose that. We, we've messed up, we've messed up the Feng Shui, the geomancy of the landscape, so we get sick. This is where the geopathic stress comes from. This is why we need geomancers today. Um, so there, I just wanted to give you that background on that particular subject. But there's there's more to these grids than ge the elemental realm. We have this whole idea of cymatics, for instance, the way sound affects matter. And years ago, my, my publisher, is a brilliant uh, geometer as well, John Martineau, worked with me uh, on certain aspects of the book. And we found all these different principles the earth makes these different um, sounds these different harmonies like the harmony of the spheres and many of them if applied to cymatics how sound affects matter we find that there are geometries will occur on a global scale as well as on a much smaller scale and there were tests done on ch uh, childly plates and other such things we have what's called spherics tweaks and whistlers um, and these are auroric kilometric radiation uh, from the solar wind when it hits the earth magnetic field and these travel between um, the ionosphere and the earth moving up and down constantly around the planet um, and these are really interesting because the energy these create move along the magnetic flow lines of the planet which are the energy lines we were talking about. So there's lots going on that we can't see, but it's affecting us. And the ancients somehow had an understanding of this uh, and, and these multiple mega geometries. And when we see their same principles at play, and we look at the same geometries that the earth supposedly kind of creates, using cymatics are found in these small stone spheres found all over Scotland. There's 425 of these being found. Um, and they're perfect geometries, um, showing Archimedean and Platonic solids, suggesting they had a high understanding of many of these different uh, things we don't realize. We also have um, the fact that these stone circles were specifically placed, often ceremonially, and there's a big question mark, there's a big debate in geomancy itself about how, how were they choosing these sites, because there's there's obviously there's you could be surveying the ancients were clearly surveying the planet they were choosing sites specifically geometrically across the landscape was there something else involved was there like an intuition involved 
And I believe there might have been because we had an experience, myself and Sean, we were building some stone circles and wood hinges a few years ago. And we built one in 2006 at a place up in the Mendip Hills near Glastonbury. For, and it was for this festival. We used to run these festivals called the Big Green Gathering. We, had the, we ran the Earth Energies Field, yeah, the Earth Energies and Divinatory Arts Field, where we had this our own little festival within a festival. We would invite all these amazing speakers and workshops and downs and classes and stuff. We built the stone circle at the top there. And then, you know, we forgot about it. It's still there. People go and visit it. They think it's an ancient stone circle. Um, so we, we lined it all up with John Martin. So it's precision astronomically aligned with the landscape, with the stars, it's earth energies. It's like we, we went into all the principles we believe the ancients did. Then a few years later, we just forgot about that. And we did this other festival and we built this wood henge, this wooden stone circle but made of timber posts. And then we forgot about that. It actually got demolished a couple of years ago. Uh, a few years later, we thought, hang on a sec. Me and Sean looked at the map. And we drew a line between them and it went directly through the center of Glastonbury Tor, um, and exactly kind of half, almost exactly halfway. And we were like, whoa. And we realized we'd aligned them together to Glastonbury Tor without knowing, you know, and it was like an intuitive choice, the exact spots we chose. If we just moved it like 50 yards one way, it wouldn't have aligned. And so that woke us up to the fact that there's an intuition involved here in the layout of these sites. And, and it's like the communication with the land itself or the elemental realm or both. Um, obviously this is a whole bunch of grids. This is the earth, this is the world grid uh, and a whole bunch of other things we've been talking about. It's ley lines, obviously, alignment of sites. We have the Michael line going across um, East West virtually with the lunation triangle and other such things all over the country. And you know, we have to question what this was all about. Was it part of this harmonic kind of um working with the land, building these stones? So with with Stonehenge, for instance, um we have this is actually from an archaeological study. Uh this is called Electrical Resistivity Survey, and they found yeah, the black line on the left is just a path. It's not, not energy or anything. The top right, though, that's, that's the entrance to the site. That's the northeastern entrance. That's the summer solstice alignment. And they found that through this electrical resistivity, you can see how much uh, electric charge through these telluric currents has moved through the site. And you can see it all comes in from that particular spot. And the reason it only goes in there is because of the henge, because of the ditch circular ditch around the edge is th over three feet deep so these telluric currents um if they hit like a anything that's over three feet deep they just follow the path of least resistance and find it where the surface is flat and then they charge in and then they charge in they hit the stones and charge up the whole stone circle within so all these energies coming in from different angles, they all follow the part and they all come in at the same entrance and then hit the stones, charge them up. They actually found pits in the center of Stonehenge that had, had grains in them, seeds, which had been charged up. And so they know that they were working with charging these seeds up. We know about all the ceremonies and everything that took place there. So they were affecting their consciousness as well. We have the same principle at play with uh, Avebury and the 99 stones around the, the main perimeter, every single one of those stones, uh, which is made of sarsen, which comes from a few miles away, um, just uh, to the east of the site, um, they, you know, each, every stone has like a magnetic orientation from when it was formed millions of years ago. As the north-south, you can find, you know, can work it out with technology. And if somehow, unbelievably, every single stone in that circle is pointing magnetically to the next one every single 99 stone it's like whoa and then it, but, but when it, where it joins the avenues they point along the avenue and each stone in the avenue points along so there's this subtle magnetic control of the movement of energy around the site the other thing is that that's when I mean, that's what it would have looked like you know with this energy moving through the whole landscape but not only do you have that you know, built into the site, we also have the fact that there's these massive earth energy currents called the Michael and Mary energy lines that move through the whole Avebury complex, all the other sites, as well as the main circle. And you can see those here. You can see the Mary line, the 
Michael Wright, the way they move. So they, they go all the way across the country, which you can see here. So these, these, this straight line going across is the Michael Ley line, the straight line, and then these two energy currents, like a caduceus, moving around a male and female energy current, which was discovered by Hamish Miller and Paul Broadhurst um, back in the 1980s. And so they go through Avebury. So where they come into the site is through the avenue, through the main avenue entrance. And so these energies that these are some of the largest ones you find are actually then manipulated by the magnetic kind of control and orientation of each of the stones. So there's all this subtle energy work going on at these sites that people are not aware of. I'm sure all you guys are, of course, but it goes all the way across the country. And so, you know, I've studied this, I've traveled virtually all of this, this, this line, to be honest with you. Um, Stonehenge is not it though, but Avebury is. Stonehenge is a bit further south. And um, yeah, and just shows you in more detail just where they, they go through the site there. They actually kind of join up and kind of kiss each other through a certain part of the site. It's very interesting. And they have it again, but there's even potentially a global version of this with a whole, um, there's global energy lines. This is the work of Robert Kuhn. And this is, you know, this is uh, a kind of visionary guy from Glastonbury. This isn't, we don't know if this is for real, but we kind of looked into this and, you know, if, if you look at the main line that goes through Britain there, then goes across the Atlantic into South America, for instance, that's just one one of them. We we spent quite a bit of time and we actually found that it they kind of go through the island of the sun. So this serpent and dragon energy line goes through where Viracocha, the serpent god, emerged onto Lake Titicaca, uh, founded the whole civilization. So it's very intriguing. This is actually the spot where it meets. Um, incredibly and then we have uh, the rock of the cat now, this is another really interesting site in the island of the sun in Lake Titicaca this is again worked on by um, John Burke and he found it had to either side of it supposedly that's the shape of a sleeping puma now you have to kind of visualize that um, a little bit I'm not sure how you see that really but it's there apparently and Underneath it is where there's lots of offerings are made of seeds and grain still, and this is where the earth energy line directly goes through. Also, there's strips of something called elemonite, a certain type of mineral either side, which is highly charged, highly magnetic. And so this was a very sacred area of people who have ceremony, have visionary experiences, other such things. There's stories of light phenomena happening there. Um, and so on and so forth. Offerings of gold were thrown down the, just the edge there. Behind that is the lake itself. Um, I've been there a few times, it's absolutely blown me away. Um, but the Rock of the Cat, if you, I mean, apparently this is all closed on the island, it has been for a couple of years now, something, there's a big dispute between the North and Southern Islanders for some reason. But the Rock of the Cat is very interesting. Uh, it's just a, a cat, just to make sure you understand what we're talking about there. Um, and there's a view of the kind of dolmen structure that we just looked at. But also following this, you know, from a different angle, we have the, the path of Viracocha, which goes northwest from Lake Titicaca, going through all the major sites, which is another one of these global energy currents, uh, which is basically this other one here. If you look at this one uh, coming down through the Americas, there's these two great currents around the world apparently the plume serpent which is that one and the rainbow serpent and uh, so that so potentially uh, is thought that this is part of that but this is a tradition going way way back in ancient Peru about these particular sites so yeah so uh, let's just got a couple more slides yes yeah, so there's quite a lot to think about here but you know this 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 Michael and Mary energy line system really really broke my kind of way into this subject if it wasn't for this i wouldn't have probably got into this because i was interested in the crop circles and then i got fascinated by the earth things i could sort of feel them i started learning dowsing and other such things and then i used more scientific equipment to like prove these theories and it's to me it's all a reality this is the invisible reality of the ancients it's what john michelle you know who's my mentor is brilliant author called the enchantment of the landscape um, and there's other aspects to this. We have, you know, for instance, we have this line going across here. That's the Michael line again. But then we have these things all over Britain 
called glass called uh, landscape zodiacs and so they're like 10 mile wide effigies of all the different signs of the zodiac carved out by rivers roads old tracks earthworks mounds and other such things and there's, there's clearly that going on here um even a even a dog i could it's called the girt dog of langport where there's these traditional songs that are sang there every year and they throw apples into the river to feed the girt dog of langport so there's all these myths and stories built up around this this is another part of like bringing the heavens down to earth it's part of the enchantment of the landscape we have borough mount this is like a mini glastonbury tour and at the uh, nose of the dog is where this particular um uh mound exists this is the famous ancient mound it's aligned along the michael line with glastonbury tour and strangely <laughs> this is a bit weird on the tail of the dog you can see there written it's called wag um and there's a, there's a road there called wag drove i used to live there on the tail of the dog on wag drove uh, my friend sean the geomancer lives there now by the way and so because he's very into this understanding these glass these zodiac that are in carved into the landscape and this again is about a mile wide this particular dog but if you zoom out a little bit from that there's also something else hidden there as well uh, which seems to resemble a horse or a unicorn you can see the kind of the dog still in there and sort of slightly more red and then you have the purpley blue kind of horse unicorn figure across the main area there then you have the horn the third eye of the unicorn then becomes burrow mump you know so this is a whole other like a hidden aspect and interestingly the, the, the coat of arms of England or Britain is the lion and the unicorn but the unicorn is chained up like hidden and so this is still hidden but now it's being discovered and actually in Somerton on the right there you see there there's a like a lion figure on the right um, just in in the pink and it's touching, the leg of that is touching the hind of the unicorn in a place called Somerton. Somerton is the old royal town of England. It's the royal place where the coat of arms of England was created, which has the lion and the unicorn on it. And so this is really bizarre, but this, this is the kind of magic you get when you start looking into these visible aspects of the landscape. So we have the old royal town of Britain and the royal town of Wessex. And in the landscape is encoded what was actually placed there. So this is, it gets stranger because sitting on the unicorn on the back, there seems to be some kind of figure. And at the point where its head is, it's called a high, high ham or I am, um, which is very odd. Um, and yeah, and the more you look into this, the more you find these strange correlations. And there are, this is just one of the zodiacs of ancient Britain. There are potentially 60 different areas uh, and so this again is part of this enchantment of the landscape system and that's just a picture of a unicorn and a dog um, just to emphasize the point um, and then if you extend that unicorn's horn which is just I'm just throwing this out there this is kind of fun uh, if you extend <laughs> I just did this on Google Earth if you extend the Glastonbury unicorn it goes through Caramore this massive megalithic cemetery in Ireland it goes through the old Hudson Bay North Pole where before the you know the slippage of the earth you know at least twenty thousand years ago uh where the north pole would have been it also goes through mount shasta which uh, some of you uh, might appreciate and so you know we're finding you know potential magic in the landscape here but it's not just that it's like what we're getting into in the next book is, is my my brother did this illustration um but what we're getting into in the next book is this geomantic significance of these myths and stories and ancient sites because it's these you know when you start this is something that jj was talking about with the apron full of the goddess or the giantess dropping stones across the landscape we get into this in detail in, in the book um and actually you know strangely there's all these myths everywhere i mean wales is where it's all happening we've got this remarkable discovery of all these stories that encode everything I've been talking about today into these old stories, myths, and legends. It's all there. It's got to decode the old stories, the old legends. And suddenly there's this geomantic elemental world of enchantment, which the ancients used to live in because they nurtured, they built these sites, they maintained them. They uh, elevated the energy of the landscape. They guaranteed fertility. 
and they were working in a scientific and intuitive manner. And these giants were part of that. And that's what we're going to get, that's what we get into in the next book, obviously. So um, I hope that's given you some ideas uh, for research. And I, I thank you very much for listening. And obviously, if you've got any questions, that's, that's fine as well. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you, Hugh. That was very cool. I, <clears throat> I always learn a lot when I uh, talk with you and listen to you. Does anybody else other than myself have some questions? I'll let you guys go first. I think Geraldine is trying to turn her sound on. No, I should not. Uh, she's having a cup of tea or something. <laughs> One question I had, um, Hugh, was if, if the stones are creating some kind of magnetic elect electrical energy that somehow charges the seeds, um, have you seen any research where they just try to use magnets or something to enhance seeds or? Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's actually something that John Burke was working on. He had a, a company called Seed Tech and then he died, unfortunately. Um, and Seed Tech was based upon principles of, weirdly, just to, just to quickly backtrack here a sec, he discovered this technology hidden within the ancient sites and, it, and he developed it for his company, which was a multi-million dollar company, through the study of crop circles. That's how he found it. Okay. He found that, like, for example, when crop circles appear, there's all these stories of these balls of light occurring and other such things. And he found, very strangely, that when you go back the next year to the exact location where the crop circle is, all the crop there in that exact circle would grow almost twice as large in some cases, a much better quality yield. It's like, oh, so whatever's forming these crop circles, hint, hint, something to do with the elemental realm, is, you know, trying to say something, trying to give us information. And so I, I think, and then he developed that into this idea that actually this is what these ancient sites are as well. Then he realized, yeah, if you can manipulate magnetism, electric charge in certain ways, you can, you can have a little device that does it. And this is why dolmens are everywhere around the world, almost every country on the planet. You have your local dolmen, yeah, and then if you know where to position it and you'd be given the knowledge and, you can actually have your own little energy generator uh, in your back garden. What about, um, and that's very fascinating. I, I'm going to check that book out because I, I'm, I'm really fascinated with the idea of if you could grow your, if you could get more yield out of your seeds, Monsanto, as you said last time we spoke, would be obsolete. I, I agree. Yeah, this, this is the thing. When John Burke was doing this, uh, he was developing this company. He, um, it was around the same time Monsanto were getting a grip on the planet. He mysteriously died, right? This is, this is the other annoying thing. He, something strange was going on, I think. Uh, I don't think he just, you know, there's more to it than meets the eye. He could have replaced GM alone with his company because he, it, and it would have been virtually free what he was doing. And so, it, you know, it's a reality. You, you can you can work with this. So it's a good knowledge to have in these uncertain times. You know, and I think it, you know, it could be very useful. And it's very simple. You know, if you can, um, you know, I mean, we, we've got you know, we we've, we've built little you know trilithons and little stone circles in our garden. You know, like this tool, you know, for the thing is to hang out. And um, <laughs> uh, we're getting growth around those as well. You know, we're really? like, you know, and we haven't we haven't designed it or anything. We just put it there, just you know, intuitively. And so there's little weird things like that. I've got my friend Maria Wheatley, she's a geomancer and dowser. She's been looking into this. She's been doing some tests. Um, and there's a woman called Alana Moore. You can get the book. It's called Stone Age Farming by Alana Moore. Uh, she's Australian. And she's she's uh, worked with placing stones all across farms, her farm, and got a remarkable result. She's sort of created this whole grid of energy just, uh, just occurred by placing stones in specific spots. She sort of dowels the best place to put them. And so it is a reality. There's also the work of Philip Callahan. Um, I forget the name of the book, but um, if you do Philip Callahan, you'll find some interesting stuff. Um, yeah, so there's, there's people who are doing this. It's, it's certainly a reality. But this elemental realm thing, this is really developed by Patrick McManaway, and that is a whole other thing because, you know, you're not really doing the work. You're getting the elementals to do it. You know, so, you know, if you want to, you know, so this is so this is different reality going on here with, with this work as well. It's not just about what we can see with our physical eyes. 
And what do you think about the uh, stone circles and pyramids and things all around the world? Since they're generating so much electrical mag electromagnetic energy, uh, do you have any theories behind the possibility of, could it have been a sort of electrical power plant, a free electricity for everyone, possibly a force field to protect the planet from asteroids and meteorites? Oh, that's a, that's a good one. Um, that I'm not sure about. I don't know if it would protect you to that level, but when it comes to electricity and things like that, you look, in, you look at Egypt, it looks like they have power tools. I know it sounds strange, but again this goes back to the work of engineer chris dunn and he he thinks that's the case you know so where were they got the power to do that where how would they have lit up these dark chambers deep under the ground you know there was no evidence of fire or, or, or charcoal or anything and so there's things like this which which fascinate me but also we have to question you know if our civilization goes down how a future say it goes under massive floods how how is anyone going to know the internet even was around you know so did the ancients have some kind of internet as well was this part of the internet system where they were able to communicate and share information worldwide you know there's, there's things like this we need to consider because you know if, if our civilization goes down thousand years in the future no one's going, there's going to be this myth of the internet you know this google myth you know and like no one's going to know what it means and like i think that's the same same kind of principle that they had certain things going on where they you know where they've just started to um you know we've just started to understand the ancients you know in that respect so i think there may have been more to it than meets the eye it's just understanding what that might have been it could have been you know, it could have been enhancing your pineal gland consciousness, which is maybe why they elongated their skull. Um, so there would be a higher than average telepathy and information sharing in that realm. And these energy lines, ley lines, grids could have carried that more effectively. That's one idea. And the crystal, the quartz, you know, carries information. And so they could have utilized the quartz mm -hmm. you know, within these stone circles and other certain pyramids and such to to you know manifest that go ahead ryan did you uh unmute yourself whoa there we go sorry i uh i had to switch hi. switch screens hi hugh hi robert hey there uh, so uh hugh uh I'm, I'm in my neophyte stage here of the archetypal levels of the universe and the spiritual energies and it, uh the power spots of the, of the world I, I came out of the commercial real estate field, but in the last year I've done a lot of transformational work. And now um, I think this, this, since December and then in February into March, I visited Egypt, visited 21 sacred ancient power spots. Uh, the main reason I went there was to take a biogeometry foundational course, which oh teaches you to you know do all the things that you said pretty much but like locating these power spots the hartman and curry lines and then um you know harmonizing those those uh spaces and then even gets into bio or sorry bio signature so biogeometry is the study of these shapes the resonance of those are all this waveform so very much very much into this i just wanted to speak up and say that in the future as I, I engage with some groups there. Dr. Karam, uh, the, who wrote the book Back to the Future for Mankind, is teaches these biogeometry courses. He would be one of the um, project participants for an archaeological site that we're looking to to create an academy as well as uh, do some other things that I can't really talk about yet. But in my you know my neophyte stage here of understanding all these things, but having a good education so far and awareness, it's it's caused me to make a complete 180 transition in my career. So I'm, I'm completely fascinated uh, by all this and love to collaborate, collaborate in the future. So I'll ask a question. Have you, have you heard of Dr. Krim, uh, Dr. Ibrahim Karim? I have heard of him. Yeah. I don't, I don't know his work uh, uh, particularly, but I've certainly heard of him. Yes. Yeah. What's he's, his main thing then? He's a bi biogeometry. Biogeometry. So about 40 years ago, he started studying this. He's an architect and engineer by, by trade, and he took an interest in physical or French radiesthesia, traveled to France, and ended up being quite profoundly handed the entire library of books from uh, the two French guys that studied this early on. And he's developed the practice now 
to a, a school as well as uh, you know consulting for many different industries whether it's health medical cellular agriculture animal uh, and part of that's biosignatures that kind of help put the body into homeostasis in certain ways but uh, but definitely in a home balancing or home practitioner realm you know working with the the energy ley lines of the Hartman and Curry of the earth and then other things that are present in our modern society such as all the electricity all the um, electromagnetic radiation electromagnetic frequency so you actually can only in, almost in a multi-dimensional way harmonize those energies instead of them being um, negative so uh, pretty pretty interesting stuff but yeah I just wanted to say hi and um, sometime in the future maybe reach out and, and connect in some way then no, no, uh, yeah I've heard about these these groups do so I'm not really a member of any any such thing myself yet but uh, because I've got uh, I've got like some of my best friends are like master geomancers I kind of just allow them to teach me when they can <laughs> um, and like we obviously we on these tours we, we kind of often invite geomancers and dowsers to join us or they just want to come because they know we're into that but we don't you know we we don't overtly kind of talk about that too much because uh we also have this sort of archaeological kind of megalithic you know, that's part of megalithomania and we have to, you know a lot of people won't you know we have to kind of balance the the kind of alternative with the academic a little bit so but i think i think there's a future in this 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 kind of geomancy biogeometry field that you know people just need to understand I mean, you look at feng shui that goes back thousands of years and that's the same principles you know uh, the same principles of working with the land but then you have obviously the working with the body you know the meridians the understanding all these different aspects and there's so much disruption of geopathic stress um that it really needs to be addressed you know uh, you know on a more global more kind of standardized scale because it, cause it's quite worrying that people can actually be sick because of their environment yeah ab absolutely and it, it's a it's a very broad subject and you know my intent is to keep you know one foot on the ground with this and, and keep it based and proved by science but obviously a lot of this was was there but it was has been here before us and now we're learning to explain it and harness it and use it for the greater good so thank you Absolutely. thanks guys yeah i agree, yeah, I, agree. I, I think it's a great thing you got into and uh yeah i'm, I'm very interested in that yeah did anyone else have some questions oh i think i'm muted no i'm not yes, oh, I something to catherine here catherine go ahead it's it's a rather short question you you said uh, in the egypt area there were these um alien like figures on stones i'd like to ask what do you think that means or how did they perceive the relation from humans to aliens or were there even aliens around why is that what do you, what would you say um i don't recall aliens uh was Dinosaur. it was it this you said something in the pretty much in the beginning. There were two pictures. Okay, let me see if I can find them. I can't see. Uh, what about Egypt? Mm -hmm. Okay, let me just find it. See what I've got. No, I mean we have the we have the Viracocha um, kind of mythos um, and Quetzalcoatl, and then we have the Happy Happy in uh egypt which is this, this is jj's uh, graphic um and we have these kind of almost like some kind of beings riding within this kind of feathered serpent surrounding them holding some kind of device like a what people think is a man bag um that's actually the correct way around um that's the one from egypt and we find it in different places so we don't i don't know if that you mean that that's the only thing i've mentioned that might resemble that um, oh, I don't know. I'm I'm rather new to the whole thing, so not an expert, okay. but kind of a structure. That's fine. Yeah, but I mean, some people have suggested, you know, just to talk about the alien side of it. I, mean, I do, I do go on the ancient alien show uh, once or twice. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of people have suggested things that you can see here are representations of flying vehicles, for instance. I mean, and to be honest with you, some of the some of the stuff we 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 have researched goes into that territory. And we can't help it because it's all there in the ancient records. You look at Enoch, for instance. 
yeah. which is one of the last books in the Bible. And then we've got the Book of Giants as well. <clears throat> the book really talks about these watchers or these Anunnaki or so, you know, different names for them. Just flying from one there, you know, Garden of Eden, Carsag area to other parts of the world, even to Britain in some cases. This is what we feature heavily in the, in the forthcoming book. Um, because it clearly demonstrates that. I mean, that's just one aspect of this. Um, but yeah, I think there's something to that. Also in Egypt, you do have depictions in Abydos, what looks like a tank, you know, like a flying machine, a uh, helicopter, a kind of space cruiser and other such things. So that could be uh, part of it as well. But yeah, I think there are, there are alien elements to consider here, even though it sounds kind of far out. Yeah, thanks. And hey, Robert, did you have a question? Yes, yes, yes. You would say, yeah. Sorry that we didn't meet last weekend in Clastonbury. <laughs> yeah, that was no, a pity. I, I have a question about uh, Kobrakti Tepi. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was you, but I have heard absolutely from Graham Hancock and also from Andrew Collins that the place was buried. Yes. Was, how do you think it was buried? Were people shuffling it through? Or God, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's a good question. Why I mean, do we have to dig it out? <laughs> well, the thing is, uh, that, that, that fascinates me with that, is it, they repaired it, okay? They didn't just bury it, they repaired everything as best they could. They tried to prop everything back up. You know, it's a, it being it probably gone into disrepair. It stopped being used maybe after two thousand years of use, and they did actually bury. You know, sometimes during the process, you know, before they buried it, they would actually cover up certain enclosures with mounds and build on top of them. And so, but when they finally did it, it must have been the largest construction job on the planet up until that time, because it was thousands of hundreds of thousands of tons of rubble mud and it was all carefully placed it wasn't just thrown in and hidden it was carefully placed repaired so things wouldn't get damaged and look at the stones now they're, they're in pristine some of them are in pristine condition because they did that but someone had the foresight to do that so this generation now in our, our modern times could find this smoking gun of these ancient civilizations which is what this appears to be um, and so, you know, it, it seems to have been a tradition of, you know, repairing and burying the site. It could have been for a sacred purpose. It could have been because they, you know, it was in disrepair. No one was looking after it. It could have been uh, because they wanted to do it as a time capsule for future generations to uncover. Say, hey, this is what we were doing back then. And that seems to be the case. Um, we have a similar thing, really, at the Nestle Brodgar of Orkney where they've been excavating this strip of land between the stones of Stennis and the ring of Brodgar stone circles. And they found this ancient building that goes back thousands of years to at least 3,500 BC. And there seems to have been, that seems to have been covered up and deliberately buried as well. And so why, again, we don't know, but it may have been to preserve it. So there's, there's a big debate as to exactly, you know, why they would do that. But I think, you know, we've got some ideas there. You don't think it was a catastrophe who covered it up? And... No, completely. You can see the picture there. You can see they built walls. Um, they've propped things up with stone. They've repaired things. So no, it, it's too neat. You know, it, that, that's, that's what was odd about it. It was kind of too neat. The top layer might have been like that, but I think it was buried. They might have, they might have realized there was a cataclysm coming. You know, it could be because of that. So they, so they carefully buried it so, so it would be protected. Well, that's, one, that's one other idea, yeah. But were the hunter-gatherers who covered it up or well, I don't know. more I mean, advanced? I, I, well, I mean, back then, I mean, yeah, officially hunter-gatherers hunter were existing in the world back then. But you look at the old traditions, you know, the old Book of Enoch and the Bible, you have these stories of these Anunnaki or Ananage, uh, these watchers, they were they seem to have been around back then. If they're building places like the Betley Tepe, they weren't just savage hunter gatherers, they were a sophisticated class of people. Um, you know, to come up with this abstract, artistic, absolutely superb carving technology, 
um, you know, and they weren't just, it wasn't just, you know, carving and just trying to represent things. It was like doing it in an abstract way, like an artistic way. I mean, these pillars, uh, the main pillars at the site, we've got a picture of these somewhere here, like this one of the ones here. These were representing human beings with arms going down the side and the heads were these kind of main, you know, uh, squares or rectangles on top, but they didn't have a face. They were abstract. So, you know, that has to have been developed. There's no way that's just coming out of nowhere. That is like um, a very sophisticated, very old kind of system. And so I just can't believe a bunch of hunter gatherers just decided, oh, let's build this. You know, th that was a developed culture um, coming from who knows where. Thank you. Anyone else have a question? Hi, Hugh. This is Grace. Hi. Thank you. That was incredible. You know, I have a few, um, a few insights that were going on in my head while <laughs> watching all of your information. And um, the last couple slides that you shared, one was with the connection between England and Mount Shasta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, uh, yeah. This one here. Uh huh. So okay. I haven't been to England, but okay. I have been to um, Mount Shasta. And there's really something incredible with Mount Shasta, and a lot of the locals know this, is that the mothership will hide behind clouds. And the clouds have a habit of forming a certain consciousness of the people that are um, around the mountain. So in, in uh, 2012, in June, there was a Venus transit. Mm. And I was with a group of people, one who was a grandfather of the teachings of... Um, of the Aztec calendar, Nahuatl language. So Quetzalcoatl represents Venus. So while we're there at the Venus transit, the clouds dissipate because it, we were having actually a hard time viewing it first. The clouds started to dissipate. And then across the heart of Mount Shasta, the serpent shape went across the mountain, which mm. represents Quetzalcoatl and also <laughs> Venus at the same time. So I was just wondering if um, you had any insights on that. Wow, that, is, that sounds like an experience. Um, I can share a picture with you. It's an incre it was incredible. Uh, well, look, if you look at this picture here, uh, uh -huh. weirdly, you know, this is, I don't know if this is directly connected, but it's an interesting coincidence is that you have, you have this particular alignment, this energy line that connects with Lady Kaka and Palenque, mm. the Olmec world, you know, the, the area of Quetzalcoatl, and Mount Shasta. Um, and these are all, mm. according to Robert Kuhn, different um, uh, like chakras of the planet. You know, mm. so you know, there might be something going on with that because the fact is, you, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of stuff we just don't understand that goes on with these particular sites at different, very specific times. And you know maybe it's connected with that I don't know, but that sounds that sounds like a really interesting experience to witness something so so magnificent. It was it was incredible. Uh, the grandfather said that it was one of the prophecies being answered by Quetzalcoatl, because it was around the time after um, Chichen Itza. Well, actually, the year of um, December twenty first, two thousand and twelve, when that was the time that. Our sun shines once again on us, which is Quetzalcoatl's prophecy in the um, Aztec teaching. So he appeared as, as Venus, because that's what Quetzalcoatl represents, is um, precious twin, which is the, uh, the morning star appearing with the sun in the morning and at night. So it's only one star, but it appears two. And that's kind of the, the inherent meaning of Quetzalcoatl. Yes, yes, I've read, yeah, read up on the, yeah, the, uh -huh. the it's very, very interesting. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thanks. <laughs> Anybody else have some questions for Graham? Is that you, Geraldine? You're looking to question? Uh, Graham? I mean, sorry, you. <laughs> <laughs> it's an English accent, isn't it? You think I'm Graham Hancock. Yeah. <laughs> Good English accent, it must be Graham Hancock. No, but you're way more casual. Hey, you. This is Steve Winchester. How you doing? I just got on the call. Hey, Steve. I just how wanted you doing? To say hi. Hi, Steve. How are you? <laughs> Good to hear from you, brother. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, I missed all you guys this morning. I was. I had to go to work. So That's all right. That's all right. I thought I'd jump on and say hello. 
You're about the only person in the world working at the moment. That's amazing. Uh, <laughs> I, I feel good about it, actually. Well, so, you can catch up on this anyway. As, as Robert's pointed out, you can c catch up on all the stuff you've missed anyway. So I certainly will, and I'm all so looking forward to seeing you guys in person. In yeah, yeah, future. can't wait. Yeah, hope so. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, we were supposed to be going to Chaco next week, Steve. That's right. I know. I'd, I'd, be, I'd be arriving in Arizona about now, in fact. <laughs> I would literally be arriving in your hometown, Phoenix. I would be there, but alas... It's going to have to be delayed gratification. <laughs> well, Hugh, as I said to you, you always have a place to stay in Phoenix, all you guys. Thanks. I appreciate sure. that. Thank you, sir. <laughs> cool. All right. I'll, I'll sign off and let you guys carry <laughs> on. Catch you soon. Anyone else have uh, questions or maybe some answers? <laughs> you and Jim yeah. like cats a lot, don't you? We do, yeah. We're, yeah, we're both cat fanatics, yeah, yeah. Uh, although I don't have any because JJ's allergic to them, which is a pity. But, um, uh -huh. So I have lots of pictures and stuff. I have a kitten calendar as well. I've got that up on the wall. Well, we're still going to be on for next year at Chaco, right? And oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm oh. very much looking forward to that. So everything's just been delayed a year, I think, by the looks of it. So what can you do? Well, if you can get here to Sedona anytime sooner in the next year, uh, would love to host the three of you, even by yourselves. That would be really fun. I love talking with you guys and hearing your stories, and it's a lot of fun. Excellent, excellent. And you got some good lineup tomorrow as well, haven't you? Is it continuing into the weekend? Yeah, tomorrow's Martin Gray. He's going to uh, just do a talk and take people on a pilgrimage um, and what sacred sites are about from some of the questions that he gets asked most. And he's just going to show some of his, uh, you know, some of his best shots as he's talking. And then Freddie Silva is coming on at 2 p.m. after that. Then Eric Von Donegan is uh, 6 p.m. on Saturday. Excellent. Okay, I'll be tuning in. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Nice. Absolutely. Nice. Cool. Yeah, you're welcome to tune in anytime you want. Uh I think you got the list too. Okay, Hugh. I think everyone is satisfied and uh got their question and answers. <laughs> Hello, JJ. JJ thank you. Hugh, that was very nice to hear. Oh hi, and you too. Thank you. You're such a doll. <laughs> Whose cat is that? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, but that yeah. is so cute. Oh, this is cute. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh that is your so dog. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye. Ciao. Good, good fun, Hugh. Uh, yeah, yeah. I like hanging out with you guys. I wish I was going to see you today, and we were going to grab a fresh one at the pub. But well, we'll we'll uh, have another chance for that. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, well, uh, I'll, I'll sign off then and uh, wish you all a lovely day, morning, afternoon, or evening, depending evening. on where you are. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, if you want to contact me, you can just do it through the megalithomania.co.uk uh, website. I'll just give you the links. Thanks so much. Yeah. All right. Whoops. Okay, guys. Take care. And she would refuse. Bye.